This is session eight of the Foundations in Finance module. And in this session, I'd like to take the time value concepts we used to value bonds and use them to value residual claims or equity. So let's set the table. When you're an equity investor in a business, you're the owner of a business, a stockholder in a publicly traded company, an equity investor in any enterprise, what you have is a claim on the residual cash flow, what's left over after everybody else has been paid. It's not a contractually set cash flow. It's not a promised cash flow. And generically, there are two ways you can value the equity in an asset or a business. One is to focus just on equity. Look at what you get as cash flows as an equity investor, which has cash flows left over after debt payments, and discount those cash flows back at a rate of return you would need to make given the risk in that equity, a cost of equity. The second way you can value the equity in a business is you can value the entire business, the cash flows to all of the claim holders. In this case, both lenders and equity investors. It's called the cash flow to the business, the cash flow to the firm. And discount those cash flows back, not at the cost of equity, but at a weighted average of what the equity investors want, which is the cost of equity, and what the lenders want, which is the cost of debt. It's called the cost of capital. And discount the entire business. You're saying, how does that help me get to the value of equity? If you subtract out the debt you owe, you should end up with the value of equity in a business. There will be plenty of time to revisit these, these concepts and examine them in detail, but let's set up the general picture. In an equity valuation, here's what you're trying to do. The cash flows you're looking at are the cash flows from both assets in place and growth assets, but cash flows after reinvestment needs, which can be substantial if you have a lot of growth assets, and after you've made debt payments, interest payments, and principal payments. To the extent that you borrow money to fund some of your projects, think of that as a cash, a cash inflow. Cash flows to equity are cash flows that you face as an equity investor. The discount rate you use to discount those cash flows will reflect the risk you see in that equity. And remember again the notion of an opportunity cost. It's what you can make on other equity investments of equivalent risk. What you get as a present value is the value of equity in the business. Now let's step back and think about these cash flows to equity. The cash flows to equity, as I said, are cash flows left over after every conceivable need has been met. But if you're a stockholder in a publicly traded company, the cash flow you generally receive from the company is a dividend, right? The dividend is the manager's discretionary judgment on how much the company can afford to pay out. It's observable, it's right there, and not surprisingly, the earliest discounted cash flow models to value equity were built around dividends because you could build those but in effect, what you're doing when you use the dividend discount model is assuming that what gets paid out, the dividends, is what, can, what the company can afford to pay out. The more generic, the more general definition of free cash flow equity is to not trust companies when they pay dividends. Now, act as if those might not be what the company could have paid and estimate yourself what the company could have paid in dividends. I like to call this potential dividend of free cash flow equity. And here's what you're doing. You're looking at the cash flow left over after interest payments, after debt payments, after reinvestment needs, after taxes. The way I describe it, as is the owner of a business, this is the cash left in the till after every conceivable need has been met. And remember, remember unlike dividends which are floored at zero, you cannot have a negative dividend, your free cash flow equity can be a negative number. And often if you're a young company, a startup, a growing company, it should be a negative number. So those are your measures of cash flows. Let's talk about the cost of equity. The cost of equity is the rate of return you as an equity investor need to make, not want to, need to make on this investment given its risk. It reflects what you can make on otherwise similar equity investments with equivalent risk. So if you have higher risk equity investments, your cost of equity should be higher. In fact, much of what we talked about in the context of risk measurement was setting up to come up with the cost of equity. So here's the problem, and we raise this in the context of risk and return models. If you're a publicly traded company with dozens, hundreds, thousands of equity investors, each equity investor might have a different cost of equity because they're coming from different places, different perceptions of risk. And that's why we introduced the notion of a marginal investor. The marginal investor is the price setter. Marginal investors, if you remember, own a lot of stock and trade that stock. The rest of us are price takers. In other words, the marginal investor's eyes are through whose eyes we should measure the risk in equity. And that's the rationale we use for focusing on risk you cannot diversify away, which we captured with the beta, and that we incorporate into the cost of equity. So the cost of equity discussion is very closely tied to our earlier discussion about risk and return and how it shows up in a required rate of return. 
So let's take a very simple example of an equity valuation model, an old-fashioned dividend discount model. Let's assume Con Ed, which is a public utility that serves much of New York City, a mature company, paid dividends of $4 per share in 2016. It pays out most of its earnings as dividends, which is what mature companies tend to do. As a mature company serving a part of the country which isn't growing that fast, I'm going to assume that Con Ed's earnings and dividends are going to grow at about 2% a year in perpetuity. Notice, growth rate of 2% a year in perpetuity makes this a growing perpetuity. Let's assume the cost of equity for this company, which is basically what marginal investors in this company demand for investing in its equity is 8%. I have everything I need to value Con Ed stock. I take the $4, which is last year's dividends. But remember, all perpetual growth models require expected dividends next year, expected cash flow next year, so I'd grow it out by 2%. And then I divide by the difference between my cost of equity, which is 8%, my growth rate of 2%, the growing perpetuity equation. What I get as a present value is $68. You're saying, what does that tell me? Based on the dividend discount model, based on your perspective of cash flows being dividends, the value per share at Con Ed is $68. Let's say the stock is trading at 70. You're going to conclude that the stock is slightly overvalued, slightly because it's only $2 off, but the price is greater than the value. It's simple enough, right? But remember, when you use a dividend discount model, you are assuming that Con Ed is paying out what it can afford to. Let's say that you have the capacity to compute potential dividends. You might not right now, but you will after this class. But let's assume that you can compute those cash flows, left over after taxes, reinvestment needs, and debt payments. And let's say last year, that cash flow, the free cash flow equity, a potential dividend was $4.25. Remember, Con Ed paid only $4 per share. It could have paid $4.25. And that's not uncommon. Companies often hold back cash. To value Con Ed on a free cash flow equity model, I'm just going to replace the $4, which is my dividend discount model number, and, and I'm going to put in the $4.25. Everything else about the model stays the same. Same growth rate, same cost of equity. What I get as a present value, $72.25, I would view as my free cash flow equity value. As we go through this class, I'm going to argue that increasingly you need to put your faith in cash flows and not trust companies to pay out what they can afford to in dividends. But in equity valuation, you're focused on cash flows to equity that you discount back at the cost of equity. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of firm valuation because it will require entangling ourselves with numbers we're not quite ready to entangle ourselves with. But here's the big picture. To value an entire business, you look at cash flows before debt payments. In other words, you're looking at the collective cash flows both lenders and equity investors get from the firm. So it's a pre-debt cash flow. You discount, the, it's pre-debt, but it's after taxes and after reinvestment needs. You discount that cash flow back at a weighted average of what your equity investors want, which is the cost of equity, and what your lenders want, which is the cost of debt. It's called the cost of capital. You discount the cash flows to the firm at the cost of capital. You value the entire business. And as I said, if you really want to get to the value of equity, all you need to do is subtract out debt. So you can value a firm by taking pre-debt cash flows, and that cash flow will generally be higher than the, than the cash flow at equity. But you're taking a very different perspective on valuation when you do it because you're looking at all claim holders in the firm and the cash flows they collect from those claims. And when you talk about a cost of capital, you're talking about a weighted average, a weighted average of what? Of your cost of equity and the cost of borrowing money. And here's where the tax code kicks in. The tax code is tilted towards debt. Interest payments and debt in much of the world are tax deductible. So your cost of debt might be much lower than what you actually see on your bank loan. A 5% interest rate on a bank loan might translate into a 3% interest rate after taxes if you have a 40% tax rate. Your cost of capital is a weighted average of your cost of equity and your after-tax cost of debt, with the weights being the market values of how much equity and debt you use in this firm, 80-20, 90-10, or 100% equity. So the cash flow to the firm, discounted back at the cost of capital, gives you the value of the business. You subtract out debt, you get to the value of equity. Now I'm going to give you some good news on, on valuation in a minute. But if you step back from both these models, the equity and the firm valuation models, you can also already see the drivers of value in a business. The drivers of value in a business are cash flows, the expected growth in those cash flows, a discount rate you apply to those cash flows, and a way of putting closure. And part of the reason you need closure is 
in a publicly traded company, your cash flows can keep going and going and going forever. And that's what a terminal value does in evaluation is it allows you to stop estimating cash flows and generally use that perpetual growth model that you saw for Con Ed to get a value at the end of the period. But in all valuation models, it's all about cash flows, growth, and risk. Those are the drivers of value, whether you do equity valuation or firm valuation. Now you might wonder, when you value a company, should you value the equity directly or should you value the business and subtract our debt? Well, if you do it right, if you make consistent assumptions about cash flows, debt, and risk, you should get the same value for equity using both approaches. But I'll also make an admission. That's one of the most difficult tasks in valuation is to stay consistent as you move from one approach to another. So we'll come back and address this as we go through the process of getting the specifics on valuation. But you have the tools to at least start thinking about the value of residual claims, the value of equity in a business.